Welcome to this M2 Technologies Tech Tip explaining a basic but very important software function, selecting items. Regardless of whether you're building tool path for an extremely complex engineered model or a very simple widget, you're going to have to select items as part of using the software. Since we all have to do it, why not get it done as easily as possible? Let's explore how EdgeCam's input options can help you quickly select the items you need at the time you need to work with them. One of the universal truths of software is that things are easier to select when you can see them. Let's turn off the display of the machine and temporarily hide tool path so that we can make it easier to work with this part. I'm going to demonstrate many of the input options by extracting some geometry from the part to begin with. So when we configure the command and press OK, I want to point out that immediately the picking options tab pops open you're going to see this tab fairly regularly. It's automatically popped open any time that you're in a mode where you're able to input coordinates directly, such as sketching a line or arc, position a part to get it ready for manufacturing, or actually building toolpath. In this case, since we're creating a sketch geometry, we have an option to choose which layer to place it on. By default, that's geometry because that's the active layer. We can create a new layer or select a different layer from the list. We also can select the color. So right now we're going to be creating entities that are on the geometry layer and they'll be a green color. In response to the prompt on the readout line, if before I start picking stuff I do some of the options in here, we modify how the command works. So in this case if I turn on 2D project and then select the model, the command is modified so that the geometry we extract has been projected to the zero degree Z plane. Sorry, I meant to say level, not degree. Let's change that value to five inches. And now we'll go repeat the command. When I go repeat the command and turn 2D on, notice that now the 2D geometry is extracted to the five inch working plane that we specified. Great. If we undo again, and this time I'll go back to the command, and I will not turn on 2D, but before I select stuff, I'm going to begin by moving the mouse over some area of the part other than the simple sidewall. When I leave it here, notice that on the corner of the cursor, there are two arrows that run in the opposite direction. The tab key on your keyboard has those same two arrows. This is EdgeCam's way of saying that there are multiple items in this area. Now, if you're zoomed out a long way from the part, such as if I zoom out here, then there may be a whole bunch of possible items. This is item one out of a possible nine. As I zoom in, it's one out of a possible two. As we press the tab key, the software cycles through the items there. If you hold shift and press tab, it will move in a reverse order. So I tab to get to the item I want, and then I left click to choose it, and then the command is run on the item that I selected. Very easy to select through multiple items this way. Now let's move over to the geometry layer and isolate what we've just created. Notice that this is three-dimensional geometry. It extracted all of the detail of that particular piece of the solid. If I move to a front view, let's look at how the view that you're in can impact selection. So in this case, I'm gonna start the delete command. I wanna delete things I don't wanna work with. Now I don't wanna select every single line and arc one at a time, what if I could just window select the things I want? In that case, I move the window from left toward right, and so only the items completely closed by the window were selected. If I start the command again, and this time move selection from right toward left, anything the window touches is selected. So that's pretty quickly clean the part down. The next thing that I want to do is I want to look at how we can now create points, for example, at the center of some of those arcs. Before I do that, I'm gonna change some of the arcs to different colors. So let me just pick some arcs at random and change some to some different colors. Make, we'll make this one be a bright blue, for example. So we've got two different colored arcs. When we go to the Setup tab and use the sketching commands to, in this case, create points at the center of different circles, the software asks for the arc to specify the position of the point. Well, I don't want to go through the software and pick every single green circle. What I'd prefer to do is let the software easily do that for me. 
That's where the filter button comes into play. Every command has different filters that can be set up. So for example, creating points at the center of arcs is only going to provide us with a handful of items, where if I was to create a line, lines could snap to all kinds of things. So when I'm making points at the center of arcs, one of the filters is color. What if I select to only choose the green circles? Now when I press OK, I can use that same window technique, and the software is only able to select the entities that meet the filter criteria. When I press OK, I very quickly have points created there. Now let's use that again. Perhaps now I want to delete everything except for the points. So I could start the delete command. I could go to my filter. I could tell it that it's not allowed to find points and that it's supposed to get everything that's green. And after pressing OK, when I stretch a window, everything that falls within that selection criteria is easily picked. Let's continue with some additional sketching now, and we'll sketch a quick line. And we'll have the line run from the center of one circle to center of another. Now notice that as I'm snapping to center, all I have to do is get near the center of that circle and the software can automatically snap to it with IntelliSnap. However, there are also other snaps that can be done and forced directly, and we'll show that now. So we have a line, and this line intersects the circles at two different positions. Looking in from a top view, if we go to start another line command, when it asks for the start of line, we have additional items that we can choose, such as intersections, midpoints, and so on. We can also hold down the right mouse button on the screen, and if you hold it down until the shortcut menu comes up, you can choose from many of the same types of items. So if I choose to create the line starting at the intersection, the intersection could be an actual intersection, such as that line in that circle, and then I can end the point, let's say, out over here. But let's also sketch another line just at random on the screen and show how imaginary intersections can work. So if I sketch another line out here, at some point, this line here would intersect that one, and at some point, this line would intersect. Let's go create a circle now. We'll put in a half inch radius and we'll create that circle center point at the intersection of that line and that line. And the circle is created at the location this would intersect. This technique saves us from having to create construction geometry or trim items that we don't need. Okay, let's go delete all of this sketch stuff we've made. Remember, the only layer that's visible right now is the geometry layer, so I can very safely stretch a window over everything here and delete it without risk of deleting things that are on hidden layers. We'll go show all of the items now, and what we're going to do next is we're going to show some geometry construction tips. So I'm going to create a point that I want to use as a common approach point for some toolpath, and I want that point to be based on the middle of that clamp, but up here. And there's a lot of different ways to accomplish that. As I go to create a point, and we'll change to a highly visible color such as bright red. For the position for the point, notice that we can snap to the midpoint of that clamp. So as I go select that item, and then finish, the software creates the point there. And that point is created with a snap from the X, Y, and Z axis coordinates of that clamp. From here, if I needed to, I could then take that and physically maybe move that up two inches in Z or some amount like that. And again, focus in on what we want to work with and move it up. Well, that was great, but it took two selections to do it. What if we could do it in one click? Let's undo the, both those commands and go create the point again. And this time, notice that we have options for a reference input. So when I go to reference input, now snap to the midpoint and then say from here I want it two inches positive in the z-axis. That point is immediately created at the location I wanted, but it was done in a single action. Another common or convenient use of selection is to use coordinate input, but rather than keying in coordinates directly, you know, if I knew for example that that point was x negative 7, y positive 2, z8 inches. I could key in those coordinates, but there's sometimes where I want to snap from different things. 
And so what we can do is we can set the command window up to pick from several different positions. Now that's just the same as if we, in the address bar, put in X, Y, Z. So let me hold on that for a second. If I cancel out of there and I go back to the point command, to initiate chord and input, the keyboard trick is just hit X on the keyboard. Hitting X or Y or Z opens up chord and input directly. So having just hit X, I can continue and hit Y and Z. Let's cover that again. We go to a point. I'm not going to go click chord and input. I've removed my hands from the mouse. And I'm just going to hit X, Y, Z, and then press OK. Notice the readout line. It prompts us to select the X axis coordinate. So in this case, this is where I want to grab, maybe the center of that circle. Now it says, where's the Y axis coordinate? Well, that's going to be perhaps this edge of the clamp here. And then it says select Z, and I want to use this top face here. There's the point created using snaps from an X on one position, a Y in a different position, and a Z on a different position. The next thing we want to look at is chain selection. So for this I'm going to go back to the toolpath end of things, and we'll turn on the visibility of toolpath item number 13. Now if you look closely at the part, you'll notice that this particular part, there's curvature up along those faces. And that's curvature both from the front perspective as well as the left and right side perspectives. And the toolpath intent here is to build toolpath where the chamfering tool rides along the three-dimensional face of the part. How is that done? When selecting the inputs to machine, we took advantage of the ability to use chaining. Now there's a variety of chain functions and you want to think about is the chain that I'm looking to do a two-dimensional chain? In this case it's not because we have a 3D edge we want to drive. Are the items tangent? So I'm going to turn off 2D. They are tangent. I can move over any piece in the shape and double click and immediately the software is able to chain all of the items that meet the requirements. In this case here if I had not turned on 2D chain we would not be able to select those rails because they're a three-dimensional rail. And one final option, selecting by layer, that we wanted to quickly cover. Notice if I go to the Update Fixtures command and select the fixtures to work with, the software asks us to pick fixtures. Well, there's some cases where while well, you could go and graphically pick items from the screen, if you know that they're already been organized to a single layer, it may be very easy simply to identify the layer right click over the layer, select all the entities, and quickly get those layers based on again good cam part organization. 